Well, thank you, Andrew, for that introduction, and, and thank you to CETA for having me here today and for the role you play, the enormously important role you play in shaping the agenda, the economic agenda and the broader agenda here in Australia. The last time I spoke at a CETA function, I think, was when I was Cities Minister and we were talking about uh, the Western Sydney City deal, the so-called Aerotropolis, and uh, that's a good example of the shaping, the agenda shaping debates that you've been involved in, one where you can see the impact happening uh, for those of you who spend time in, in, in Western and South Western Sydney, extraordinary impact having right, uh, we're having right now. Uh, and CEDA's role in that uh, with agenda, and it, what I thought was an agenda shaping speech uh, was important, but there's so many other areas where CEDA uh, is helping to shape the agenda, and so thank you for that. Today's speech is an important step uh, from the government's point of view in our emission reduction journey, setting the scene for the Glasgow COP, uh, which will be held later this year. Uh, we all know that the climate and emissions reduction challenge is truly one characterised by the tragedy of the commons, where the net benefits of global emission reductions, whilst very real, are distant from the costs. It's a debate that's become incredibly polarised between the keyboard warriors and the quiet Australians, between the establishment and the disruptors, between the inner city and the outer suburbs and regions, between the opposition and the government, between emotion and economics. It's truly like no other agenda in modern Australia. But I believe there has never been such a clear choice. A choice that unfortunately though is uh, fundamentally misunderstood by some. Now we, we hear some commentators, uh, some informed, some not, talk of silver bullets. They talk of policy detente, they talk of science as if it is a personal sword to strike down their opponents. And they do this because they feel rightly that this is the defining moment of this agenda and, uh, and this will be one of the defining agendas of our time. But just like the other side of my portfolio, energy, uh, security and affordability, there are no silver bullets. If there was one, the world would have used it. If setting a target today would lower emissions, then today's speech would be a very short one. I wouldn't have to outline our plan and I wouldn't have to outline the work that has led to today. If I could stand up today, announce a target and see the CO2 emissions fall, then I would. But it's sadly, a target without a plan is meaningless. It is the worst part of this emission reduction debate. A target without a plan lets people who I know mean well it lets them say something and then ignore the hard work. Because to reduce emissions globally, and that's the challenge, this is a global challenge, there is an enormous amount of hard work to come, particularly, particularly if we are to avoid damaging economic growth. The world needs to go through rapid technology development and, and, and adoption if, we're to if, if we are to achieve a, a substantial an ongoing reduction in emissions on a global scale. Now, I firmly believe Australia is well placed to take advantage of this and contribute enormously to it. Now, it's not all international. Australia must do its bit to reduce emissions to address climate change, and we are doing our bit. But we must do it in a way that secures our way of life. Not just the way of life in inner city, in, in inner Sydney, but the way of life in Newcastle, in Roma, in Townsville. But to be clear, Australia does not have to choose between reducing emissions and keeping our economy strong. But that is not assured. If we do this the wrong way, if we compare ourselves to the wrong nations or we blindly jump into the dark, then we will inadvertently wreck our economy. 
Now, I strongly support robust debates in these areas because, I said, as I said, there are strong views on both sides. What I won't accept is others talking down Australia's achievements to make a political point. Australia has done exceptionally well over the last decade and a half, despite facing particular challenges with an economy focused on energy intensive exports. While other countries' emissions continue to arise, Australian, Australian, Australia and Australians have gotten on with the job. During the year to September 2019, we saw emissions fall yet again to 231 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent, over 100 million tonnes lower than what was forecast in 2012 with a carbon tax. 100 million tonnes lower. Uh, we've seen a 13, over a 13 per cent reduction from 2005 levels and will meet and beat our 2020 targets by almost a year's worth of emissions. What's more remarkable about these achievements is that unlike almost anywhere else in the world, we've done it while our emissions intensive exports have sharply increased and our population has increased faster than most developed countries. The value of our exports has increased 71% on 2005 levels, and the corresponding emissions have also increased 54%, but we've managed to get our emissions down uh, by those levels I mentioned earlier overall. So that growth in exports is a very, very good thing. We need to increase our exports so that we can pay for the essential services that Australians have come to rely on and, and should rely on. But despite the upward pressure from exports, the emissions per capita, the emissions intensity of the economy continue to fall and are at their lowest levels in nearly three decades. Emissions per capita have fallen by 40%. Emissions intensity has fallen by 62% since 1990. Now, when you step back what all these numbers mean, they mean that Australia has been rapidly decreasing its domestic emissions in the midst of an export boom, particularly for LNG. And that gas is an important part of the emissions reduction story as well, just ask our chief scientist. Typically, Australia provides a lower emission alternative to our customers, uh, particularly in Asia. Reducing emissions compared with the alternatives using our products. Our LNG exports have potential to re reduce global emissions by up to 163 million tonnes. And we've grown the, the, the largest LNG export sector in the world in around a decade. It's an absolutely extraordinary achievement. Those exports are reducing emissions by di displacing more emissions intensive fuels overseas. Now it's a peculiar feature of the global carbon accounting system that countries that produce a product for another customer country wear the emissions associated with that product. But that's how it works. Countries like Canada, New Zealand and Australia have suffered under this system, whereas Europe, which has pushed much of its manufacturing to China, has clearly benefited. Those are the facts. To put it simply, Australia and Australians should be extremely proud of their accomplishments. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the media lately about long-term strategies, but let me say up front that a long-term strategy is not a substitute for focusing on 2030. A long-term strategy, though, does need to be scenario-based. It will need to be modelled and it should, be, it should seek to take advantage of emerging global and domestic technologies. That might seem like a subtle difference between our 2030 approach and 2050 approach, but it's important. Our 2030 targets are supported by tangible projects, tangible investments, a clear, fully costed $3.5 billion climate solutions package to meet our commitments. It's effectively top down. It includes the $2 billion climate solutions fund, Snowy 2. It's great to see the team here from, from Snowy today, Marinus, and a range of energy efficiency initiatives. We've made a commitment and we plan to meet and beat it. However, a long term strategy, a strategy that covers 30 years, needs to be bottom up. Now, the top-down approach is historically how the world has attempted to reduce emissions, but it has largely failed. Internationally, targets are missed. Australia is one of the few countries to substantially overachieve on its Kyoto obligations. 
And we did it because we have adopted the right technologies and focused on a tangible plan. Now, I should emphasise that over 70% of the world's GDP has not set a net zero 2050 target. But if you look at some of those same countries, the US, China, India, for example, they are excellent at adopting and exploiting technology advancements, and that is the key for the world. The Australian government will take a technology-based long-term emissions reduction strategy to Glasgow later this year. We want to lead the world on this. Our strategy will be based on a detailed series of, of pieces of work that we will complete over the rest of the year and much of which has already been done and the National Hydrogen Strategy that Alan Finkel led is a good example of that work. Fundamentally this will take time and it will include key stakeholders from across industry and across the economy to be involved. The work will need to evaluate, prioritise and progress technologies to full commerciality and deployment as quickly as possible without massive government subsidies once full scale deployment is viable. Whether it's a migration from gas and coal to hydrogen or widespread use of low cost geological and biological sequestration, uh, it is crucial that we take that approach. Technology offers the best prospect of maintaining and even strengthening our position as an energy export leader while supporting reductions in global emissions. But ultimately someone has to beat the blank page in how we do all of this and of course that's the role of government and will be the focus of our technology roadmap which we will release in due course. But that roadmap will be the cornerstone of, of what we take to uh, Glasgow as our, as our strategy later this year. It will provide guidance to the public and private sector on what future energy and emissions reduction technologies the government will prioritise. But we can't do this alone. The private sector will need to be front and centre in driving these changes. Uh, we as a government, federal government ha have an important leadership role in particularly in stimulating R&D and early deployment of emerging clean energy technologies. We've already invested over $10.4 billion into 670 clean energy uh, projects with a value of $35 billion, primarily through CFC and ARENA, most of which, or much of which, was solar and wind. But wind and solar, uh, as standalone uh, sources of energy, are now commercially viable. We're seeing world leading investments, and we've seen world leading investments in wind and solar in Australia, $9 billion last year and a similar amount this year. And the challenge for these sectors now is to address complementary storage and backup, as well as to address connectivity to the grid. Complementary investments in backup and storage, particularly flexible gas and pump hydro and transmission, are now critical to the future success of these sectors, which is our focus through the Grid Reliability Fund and the Underwriting New Generation Program. It's crucial that government not crowd out private sector investment. We must move our R&D investments and early deployment to the next challenges. Hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, lithium, advanced livestock feed supplements, further work on biological sequestration, just to name a few. Integration of distributed energy and improvements in transmission and demand management also offer great opportunities. We have to be comfortable managing an R&D investment portfolio and we must be comfortable changing horses mid-race if they don't perform as expected. And we must have a tra transparent process so that our investments continue to encourage equivalent or more private sector investment. And that's what the technology roadmap is all about. The first step in the process will be a consultation paper that we'll release in due course to engage with industry uh, and stakeholders more generally. Uh, that paper has been developed or is being developed from six months of initial work by the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, the CSIRO and other government agencies. And the key to that has been independent advice. If we're going to focus every possible research dollar, both private and public, on the largest technology problem in history, uh, we have to be, have some element of coordination and prioritisation in how we do it. An important part of the framework is to include stakeholder sentiment in it. And I'm pleased that Dr Alan Finkel will be a key figure in that process. Dr Finkel has kindly agreed to be the chair of the Technology Investment Roadmap Ministerial Reference Group. And I thank Dr Finkel for the work uh, that he has been doing and will do, which is enormously important to the future of this nation and the future of the world. 
Dr Finkel and I have worked together on a range of issues, but his work on hydrogen for the COAG Energy Council has been absolutely exemplary. I look forward to working with him on the development of our roadmap. Now, the reference group, more generally, will be comprised of industry, investment, government and research leaders. Uh, they will advise the government on pathways for the efficient development of new technologies, and the group will also identify projects of national significance that will turn the technology adoption dial. I will announce other members of that group in the coming weeks. Now, the Technology Investment Roadmap will also feature an annual clean technology statement. And as I said before, the government must ensure that it stays at the cutting edge of technology investment. The clean technology statements will be an ongoing and important mechanism that will allow us to do that. Each annual statement will provide an update on global technology developments and allow us to fine tune and prioritise our portfolio. We have to be extremely disciplined in continually assessing the economic viability of technologies and associated investment, and it, it'll be a fine line. We must support technologies that can win, but we must also be disciplined in recognising when technologies are struggling and in leaving deployment of technologies that have reached commercial viability to the private sector. The first task for Dr Finkel will be to work with the reference group stakeholders and the government to develop the first clean energy statement. I expect to have this statement later this year and it will be one of the most important inputs uh, in the lead up to, to Glasgow. Now, I said earlier that a target without a plan is foolish. We have a plan, but we must also track progress. Obviously, there are the regular emission reduction updates published by the government. However, that is not enough to drive multi-decadal investment. We need to measure the technology investment roadmap in two ways. First, through measurable economic goals for, for technologies that allow us to assess progress and to give a clear signal for when we're reaching commerciality. The goal for each technology is to compete with higher emission alternatives. It's pretty simple. To compete with higher emission alternatives. Hydrogen is an example where our work is already well advanced. We have a strategy. We have serious federal government investment behind it, $500 million, uh, or, or over $500 million. Uh, but we know, despite the very significant benefits that can come from hydrogen, it's not yet economic for large-scale deployment in our energy systems. The first specific goal will be H2 under 2. H2 under 2. That is hydrogen at or under $2 per kilogram. That's the point where it competes with alternatives in large-scale deployment across our energy system. With that goal, we can track how hydrogen is progressing on its cost curve. In five years, it may be $8. In 10 years, it may be 5 But we'll have a reference point on how we can reach our goal. At $5, Hydrogen is likely to be well and, well, well and truly uh, uh, competitive for long-haul transport, assuming continued cost reductions in fuel cell vehicles, particularly heavy vehicles. But not yet at $5 for broader energy substitution. By tracking economic progress, we can assess progress on reducing emissions at minimal cost, because once we reach that threshold, those technologies can be adopted across the Australian economy and just as importantly, more importantly, across economies across the world without economic disruption. Each technology will have a similar goal. Secondly, we need to track investment in R&D and early deployment. Now, as I said earlier, government investment is important as both a market signal and as a leader. To be successful from both a portfolio and technology perspective, we must track how private sector and other investment follows our investment. That is, for every dollar we invest, we want to see four or five dollars from the private sector and other levels of government following over the course of our investments. And I'm delighted uh, that we've recently penned our agreement with the New South Wales government to jointly invest uh, in many of these sorts of projects. That joint investment, that follow-on investment, is an important indicator of the success of the technology uh, from the support it's getting from beyond the federal government. A good example of this is the hydrogen supply chain project in the Latrobe Valley, where we're getting a one to ten. One to ten multiply. Every dollar we put in, ten dollars coming from others, or nine dollars coming from others. Importantly, if others aren't matching our investments, it's a clear signal that something's amiss. These two goals, 
an economic goal for technologies to get them to a point of parity where they can be deployed uh, without economic disruption and an investment goal will be the key guides for our long-term strategy. And if you have a series of goals, then you can accurately model how far and how fast Australia can reduce its emissions and the world can reduce its emissions without damaging our economy. This is how you develop a bottom-up strategy for long-term emissions reduction. Now, there's a great deal of work to do in this process. At its core, it's about technology, not taxes. It means reducing emissions, not reducing jobs and the economy. It's an approach based on rigour, discipline and optimism, not ideology. Humans are endlessly ingenious in solving hard problems with new technologies when we have to and we want to. We've done that for thousands of years and at a phenomenal pace in recent centuries. Scientists, innovators and entrepreneurs have done this driven by the opportunity to improve our lives, not by imposing taxes on the old technologies. That's, that approach of focusing people on improving our lives has worked for us until now and it will work for us in the future. Thank you very much.